Thanks. Um, so uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Professor Michael uh, Lachman, who is uh, origin, original academic studies were at the Cohen Institute many years ago. Uh, he studied here in, at the interdisciplinary program and uh, worked uh, with uh, Eva Jablonka and Shabta Ungru. He later went on to do his PhD studies at Stanford with Mark Feldman, where he worked on the evolution of multicellularity and youth sociality, especially from informational uh, perspectives. Uh, he later went on to do a postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute and at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in the Sciences. After uh, this, he spent 10 years as a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, where he worked on the evolution of gene expression and differentiation, comparing humans and other apes, and working on the Neanderthal uh, Genome Project. And for the last uh, two years, he has been a professor at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, devoting most of his time to issues related to the origin of life and evolution. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk. And the information and evolution doesn't just describe one topic. So I think it's very hard to take any topic that I work on that does not fit in here. So I try to stick in here two of the topics that I work on, one that is fairly old and one that is current, very current that I'm currently working on. Um, oh, should I talk? OK, it doesn't matter. Uh, when we talk about information, uh, the measure of information uh, was uh, in, uh, mainly introduced by Claude Shannon. And um, he introduced it in two ways. One is uh, an axiomatic approach, where you say uh, if we had a measure for information, it should be additive and other properties. But another uh, approach goes through typical sequences. And I think typical sequences kind of gives us the heart of what information is. So I want to to go through that. Um, and I think typical, the, the notion of typical sequences is, is uh, similar to the, the notion of uh, the law of large numbers and uh, things like this. And I think if, if just mathematics was built so that the law of large, large number or typical sequences wouldn't hold, all of information theory would look totally different. So let's start. Uh, let's say we, t we have a coin and we throw it. And here, white represents heads and black represents tails. We saw it uh, twice. We can have one of uh, four outcomes, head, head, tail, head, head, tail, and tail, tail. And the distribution of how many heads we have gives us this little bump where we have uh, most likely 50% heads, 50% tails. As we throw a larger number of coins, the distribution gets more and more peaked. So here's four coins. Uh, this is a, well, this is 10 coins. And you see that, um, oh, is there, there's no uh, laser pointer or something like that. Oh, good. We see that the center becomes more peaked. And as we add more and more coins, here is um, 100 coins thrown in sequence. We see that it gets uh, even more further peaked. And the, uh, the notion of typical sequences says that if we throw enough coins, if we do enough random events, then um, most random ev events will belong to the set of typical sequences of events. So in this case, it's 50-50. But if we had biased coins, it wouldn't be 50-50. It might be 60-40 or whatever the probability is. So uh, almost all, any, everything that happens is among these typical sequences. All the non-typical sequences basically don't happen. And all typical sequences have the same probability to happen. So it's basically all, they are all here in this peak, and they all have the same probability. And here's the thing that is important for typical sequences. Once you say only typical sequences of events happen, um, and, uh, and they're all equally likely, then you can say the number of events that are, the number of typical sequences is this, 2 to the power of uh, n, which where n is the number of events, 
times h, which is the entropy. So this is the thing that can, by which one can define entropy. And since they're all likely, each one of them is the probability is 1 over 2 to the n, so 2 to the minus n times h. And this property that everything outside of typical sequences ba basically never happens and everything inside typical sequences happens equally likely, this is the thing that gives us such an easy way to look at information theory. Um, so let's look what happens if we look at the coin tosses. So we have a probability for head is p, for, for tails is 1 minus p. We throw n coins. And so typical sequences will have approximately p times n heads and 1 minus p times n tails. Uh, the chance for each sequence we can calculate is p to the power of this uh, and 1 minus p to the power of that. And now if we want to see, to see what if this is true, then what is h? What is the um, what is entropy here? And you see then it has to be the 2 to the power n times h is equal to this expression, which in the end gives us this famous relationship of entropy. Entropy is equal p log p plus my minus p log 1 minus p. So the, this famous equation that existed before Shannon, but which Shannon used, um, it derives from this notion of typical sequences. And then, and this is really the reason why then um, we get the same expression in information theory here uh, in uh, entropy when we talk about an ideal gas and the molecules are either on the left or the right, and then we say what's the typical sequence of events that the molecule can take, and the typical sequence then will be defi again um, described by what I defined, or if I talk about compression of a text, we talk about the typical sequence of letters in the text or words in the text, it's all, it all then gets to the same statistic of these typical sequences, and that's why we have this sum of p log p as the entropy. Okay, but entropy is not information. If we want to talk about information, we talk about uh, differences in entropy or differences in uncertainty. So now I want to describe what mutual information is. Mutual information is in simply the proportion of reduction in uncertainty. So for example, I throw a, a die. There are six possible events. Now I look at the die and I tell you, oh, it was even. So if I say it was even, out of the six possible events, three were, were eliminated. So that means the number of possible events was cut in half. And that means that I gave you one bit of information when I told you that it was even. And this is the notion of mutual information, which is simply then the entropy before I told you what I told you, the entropy after I told you, three possible events are left and they're all equally likely. The difference between them is how much information I transferred to you. And in this case, it's a log of 6 minus log of 3 is one bit of information. OK. And now let's switch to talk about uh, information biology. And this was a, a problem that I worked on for a long time. When I work on something, I have a problem. And uh, I, I just can't, I don't know the solution to it. And um, everybody else doesn't understand even what I'm, I think about. And then once I solve it, and here I actually had, I solved it a couple of times, each time differently. Um, and uh, maybe this is the final one, but probably not. Uh, and then once I have the solution, people understand what the question was. <laughs> so um, in this case, I found it really strange that we have, um, that we have a Shannon information that describes kind of how much information is transferred in general. And then we can also talk about um, differences in fitness. Um, and it was very strange to me that these two are different things. It seemed to me that they should be the same in some conditions. And I was trying to see when it is the same. So, and the problem is this. Um, in information theory, I talk about information. I, I tell you I reduce your uncertainty by a certain amount, but I don't care at all what I'm talking about. So I might tell you, oh, look, there is a line over there, which uh, I think you would care a lot about. Or I might tell you, oh, did you know that there's this rock on the moon that is kind of a uh, square shaped? In both cases, I might have give you, given you one bit of information, but in biology, a, one of these bits you care much more about than the other. And so it was unclear, it's unclear how can you know, use the kind of the 
a general notion of information in biology a, which does not care what the information is about. Um, so uh, before this work, there were basically two ways to look at, um, at information in biology. One is channel information, which is, uh, does not care what the information is about. And you just ask how much information was transferred. The other notion of information is this Gould information uh, by uh, Jay Gould. Um, it, it's not uh, Stephen Jay Gould, it's a different Gould, um, which asks, what is your fitness without the, the information that I give you? What's your fitness with information? The differences between these is the uh, difference in fitness, and, um, and that defines how much information I transferred. So it's a difference in fitness. And I really, my problem was to somehow unify these two. Um, where you would say, how could you unify them? Because this is bits and this is fitness. What's the connection between these two? So let's, let's go to a, a very particular example, um, a prairie dog. Prairie dog lives on the prairies or anywhere else. And it needs to know, should I go out foraging? Or might there be a coyote around that will eat me? So maybe I should stay at home. And so I, I just produced this, um, this setup where um, if I forge when there is a coyote, when there is a coyote around, then uh, it's not very good for me. I die. If I forge when there is no coyote around, it's pretty good. I get one. And if I hide, it doesn't matter to me if the coyote is or isn't around, but I get less. So it's a basic game theoretic setup, and I want to to see um, what would it be worth to me if someone came and told me, "Hey, you know, the coyote is around today." Um, so what, what would I gain? So this is the, the simple setup that I want to analyze. Um, if we talk about channel information, which does not care about the setup, it just cares about bits, then if we say here, this is the frequency that the coyote is around, here the coyote is never around, here the coyote is always around, and here in between it's um, in the middle, then I ask how much information is transferred, um, it's simply, this is shown information, p log p plus 1 minus p log 1 minus p. It's this weird uh, humped uh, shape. And it does not care about this whole fitness matrix that I described to you. So this is what, how much the information would be worth according to that. Uh, the second way to, to analyze it, really do the game theoretic analysis, which says, okay, um, if this is the frequency of the coyote and I forage, then my fitness goes from one, when the coyote is uh, never around, to close to zero if the coyote is always around, and if I always forage, I always get eaten. So this would be my fitness. If, on the other hand, I'm all, I always hide, then my, it doesn't matter what the coyote does, if he's around or not, my fitness is constant. And then the best I can do in this case is um, up to this frequency of coyote always forage, above this frequency always hide. That's the best I can do without the information. If someone now comes and tells me, hey, in each case the coyote is around or isn't around, then the best I can do is this line, which means uh, in any case I will hide when the coyote is around and I will forge when he's not around, but I still, of course, my fitness will depend on if the coyote is or isn't around and I will get this green line. The difference between this green line and the red line is my gain from getting the signal, which is this triangular shape. OK, so we have these two notions, a Shannon information, this parabola, Gould information, this triangle. And this was my question. Um, are they, can they somehow be the same? Um, and in order to answer this question, uh, we'll go to uh, horse racing, uh, horse betting. Um, so this is uh, taken from Cover and Thomas, an uh, introduction to uh, information theory, a very uh, basic book, but very, very good book. If you want to learn about information theory, this is the best book you could read, I think. Um, so there's two horses. We want to know on which horse should we bet. And uh, I'm sorry if you might get very angry that I present such a stupid example, but it is, it is uh, insightful. So we have two horses, horse A and horse B. Horse A, uh, its chance to win is 10%, so it almost never wins, but the payoff is amazing. So on every $9 you bet on the horse, you get $9,000 back if it wins. Uh, horse B 
has 90% chance to win, so it's a it almost always wins, but its payoff is kind of not so good. On every $9 you bet on it, you get one bet back if it wins and zero back if it loses. And now the question is, which horse would you bet on? And it's kind of easy to calculate that the payoff here, every $90 you put on, on average you get a $9,000 back because one in 10 times you'll win. Here, every $90 you bet on the horse, you'll get $9 back because 90% of the time it wins, but you, you're, uh, it's divided by 10. So pretty easy to see that you should really bet on this horse because you, on average you get uh, $100 for every dollar you, you bet on it. Okay, so this is easy. Now what, what happens if um, these horses uh, race again and again and again and you're supposed to re reinvest your money in, in, in the next race? What should you do now? Well, then you would say, well, of course, then I will just, I'll bet on horse A all the time because, uh, I mean, I get amazing return uh, in many races, so that's what I should do. Um, so let's try to analyze this. Um, we have two horses, and they play this, uh, they race again and again and again and again, so it's the case where we can talk about typical sequences. What's the typical sequence of uh, horse races of the results? Uh, around 90% of the time horse B wins, and 10% of the time horse A wins. So if I bet a certain fraction of my money on A and a, a one minus this fraction on B every time, then, my money will be multiplied by one ninth times how much I bet on horse B every time horse B wins, and a thousand times how much I bet on horse A every time horse A wins. So in the end, now I'm just looking at the typical sequence because all the other sequences never happen, so we don't need to consider them, right? So this is the strength of this notion of typical sequences. You don't need to think about all the other sequences. If you were, if you want to say, what happens most of the time. So in biology, we care about what happens most of the time, right? I go to a field and I want to know what will I find most of the time. Um, in some other cases, you know, maybe when you want to make money, you don't care about what you, uh, what you uh, gain most of the time. You get, care about how much you get on average, right? And that might be a different answer. But in this case, I'm looking at what happens most of the time. If you want to look at what happens most of the time, you need to look at these typical sequences. So in a typical sequence of events, 90% of the time horse B wins, 10% of the time horse A wins. So this will be our return. And, um, and now, I'm sorry, this was the only place we really need to follow the math in the whole talk. Um, so uh, so this, is our, this is how much we gain, right? If we, if we bet A of our money on horse A and one minus A of our money on horse B, this is our return. Now we want to maximize this. If we want to maximize this, we might as well maximize the log of this, which is equivalent. So if we maximize the log of this, we try to maximize this. So this goes down here, and uh, this is the log of this, and then the log of this. And um, if you remember, taking log of a product is like the sum. So we can take this, a pro log of this product can be divided into these two parts. And now what you can see is that um, A, right? We try to find what's the best A, right? And A now, here in this case, we have A here, and nothing was A here. So A dropped out of this. And if we take the second part, A is here, and it dropped out of this. So in the end, we only care about this and this. And if you look very precisely here, um, the return, which is this 1,000 and the ninth, they dropped out there. Here's the thousand and here's the ninth. So in order to solve this, now suddenly the return, we don't care about the return, which is something very strange. Suddenly our strategy is independent of the return. And um, this is maximized when A is equal to P. So this means that 90% um, of the time we bet on horse A and 10% of the time on horse B, which we'll return to in a second. Um, so that's what I told you. That was the last place where you really need to follow the math. Now you don't need to follow the math. But um, we can, oh, I'm sorry, here's again this. Uh, but so uh, we can also rewrite this expression in general and just look at the end here. What we get is this. So this is how much we get 
if we do the strategy A, so here's A, and um, if we rewrite this expression, it will, it will give us something like this. So this is some sum of fitnesses minus the entropy of, a, of the result. So P, right? P is the probability of different horses win. So there's something with fitness minus the entropy minus, and this is, an ex this is a very important expression in information theory, the kublik leibler divergence, which basically means um, if the truth is P, so let's say that I, I have a text and I compress it. And I think it is actually the distribution of letters is P, but I behave as if it's A. So I, I use the wrong distribution of letters, uh, and I try to compress the text with that distribution. How much longer will the text be? Will the compression be? So the kohlbeck leibler is the, the difference in the, in a, the, between what the truth and the thing that I think. How much will this cause me to, uh, uh, to make the text longer? You know, like in this case, lose fitness. And the kohlbeck leibler between A and P, if A is equal to P at zero, right? If I think the truth is what the truth is, then the, I, I will be optimal. And if A is bigger than, if A is different from P, it will be bigger than zero. So here I subtract something that um, is maximized when A is equal to P. Okay. Um, so now we go back to the horse race, and here it's very strange. Yes? Can you just clarify something? With horse P, do you get your $9 back plus one, or do you just get $1 back? One back. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that's why I apologize. How much did you put on? Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a case where when the horse wins, you actually get less back than you put on it. And if it loses, you lose everything. And so, but now suddenly, this, this uh, analysis tells us 90% of your money you should put on this horse that gives you less back than you put on, on it. And only 10% of the money you should put on this amazing horse that gives you such a big payback. Um, so this is uh, strange, but it is because, um, because you reinvest again and again and again in, uh, in many races. And this actually, so um, I think, so this, this kind of bet hedging um, was described by Kelly very quick, very shortly after Shannon introduced uh, information theory, but then Cover um, expanded on this, so Cover from Cover and Thomas, and, uh, and he had, I think, an uh, investment firm in, uh, in the stock market. And out of this bet hedging, he made, I think, a lot of money. Um, so even though it seems weird, but bet hedging works sometimes. I haven't tried it. Uh, <laughs> OK, so now let's go back to our coyotes. So actually, prairie dogs uh, also reinvest their, their, their investment. So they have offspring. The offspring pay a certain strategy, then the, all the offspring that survive will then be, go to the next generation and be reinvested and play the same game and reinvest and play it again. So evolution actually does this reinvestment. So actually, if we want to solve the evolutionary, prob the evolutionary problem, it's not the game theoretic setup we need to solve, but instead this uh, reinvestment setup that we should solve. And when we do that, and we ask how much do we gain now from uh, this reinvestment, uh, the, uh, the prairie dog will need to bet hedge, sometimes go out and sometimes not, depending on a kind of a toy, toy cost or something. No, not toy cost, a coin toss. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the, what we get then is this weird, uh, uh, what's it called, connection between uh, we take the Gould information, the Shine information, put them one, two together on one graph, and we get this, uh, instead of the triangle, we get a triangle with a round corner. And now the units, so if here the unit was bits and here the unit is fitness difference, right? We put them into one graph and the unit here is bits, but actually the bits, the meaning of bits for fitness is fold increase in number of offspring, right? And this is, this is why, right before, it was weird. How can you put two graphs on the same graph when one is bit and the other fitness? But actually, fitness is about increase the number of offspring. And so you can talk about fitness differences as difference in fold increase, which 
can be counted in bits. Um, and so how, so I, till now I just told you how much I get, what is my optimal strategy, right? Uh, but in order to calculate this thing, I need to talk about difference in uh, what happens when I get a cue, right? When I get a signal from the environment. So what do we do, what do we do then? Initially, when I have no information, there is a certain chance that the community is around, a certain chance that it's not around. Now I have information, so then if I do get, say, an alarm call, then given that the alarm call is there, there's a chance that the coyote is around and a chance that it's not around. Maybe it's 100% that the coyote is around if the alarm is totally reliable. If there's no alarm, again, there will be a chance that the coyote is around and a chance that it's not around. And now, in each of these cases, I need to choose my optimal strategy. So it was, my world was divided into two cases, one when I hear an alarm call, one that not, and now I need to say, should I, what should I do, right? And um, it's, so it's tr solving the same problem twice, this, the problem that I had before, now I have to solve it twice. Again, this math that you can ignore, but the, and the only, so only thing you can notice here is that now everything is conditional on the, on the, on the alarm call, right? So C is the alarm call, Everything now is conditional on the alarm call. If the alarm is there, I do the whole thing that I did before. If the alarm is not there, I do the whole thing that I did before. And I get the same expression in the bottom. So something that depends on fitness minus the conditional entropy now, conditional on the alarm call, minus it's called like Leidler a divergence. And as it turns out, when we now want to see the value of information, it's the difference between these two. Um, this cancels, so now this cancels because it's the same, this cancels because um, it's, I mean, it turns out mathematically it's also the same. And all that remains is these two things, which is the entropy um, wi without the, co the alarm minus the conditional entropy with the alarm, which as I told you at the beginning, difference between entropy is mutual information. So the fitness difference, if I use bed hedging, is exactly equal to the mutual information between the, um, the alarm call and the probability of the coyote being around. Um, and now, and this is actually one of the biggest mysteries here, how can this be, right? How can it be that if I give you one bit of information about the lion, or I give you one bit of information about the moon, from point of view of a fitness increase, it gives you exactly the same fitness increase, right? Doesn't make any sense. Biology does care what the information is about. How could it be that I did this whole mathematical derivation and suddenly biology doesn't care what the information is about? It's always exactly the mutual information, exactly Shannon, right? And uh, so do, do you see the, the paradox here? Yes, right. Um, and the solution is that I, I snuck in the bet hedging. So it is exactly equal to the mutual information only if I can use bet hedging. So if you look, if you looked at this, um, uh, right? This was the the value of the information, right? And it's kind of this: you glue together two functions, the Gould, the triangular thing, with the Shannon, this parabola thing. In the middle of this thing, of the function here, when the coyote is has a high chance but not too high, then I bet hedge. Some some of my offspring, I'll tell them go and do this, and some will stay in the burrow, right? I bet hedge, so that not everybody will be eaten by the coyote. But if the chance of the coyote is too low, then you always uh, go out. If the ch chance of the coyote is too high, then you always hide. So these are these two parts, right? Where it doesn't, uh, you, you don't bet hedge. So only in the middle you bet hedge. And um, so when you bet hedge, the value of the information is exactly mutual information. So this, the reason that, um, that you get the same for line and the moon is if you cared about the moon enough to bet hedge on, on what the shape of the rock is, then if someone comes and tells you what, it, what the shape is and you bet hedge after they tell you. So if this happens, then the value of information is exactly equal to the Shannon information. But usually most of us don't really care about the rocks on the moon. We don't bet hedge on them. We are, what we do is independent, like here, independent of what the chance of the rock to be round is. And that's why the value of information is zero. Um, so the, uh, the 
value of the, the reason that it's exactly equal to Shannon is only when we care enough to bet hedge on, on the result. But it's still really interesting that we see here that a fitness can be measured in bits, right? And this is the second part that we, we see that um, evolutionary fitness is, a is something that we can measure in bits. And this is the second uh, uh, result that we get from this calculation that Fitness is an information measure, in, in a sense. And so why is there a connection between fitness and information? And uh, I think you probably saw it already. It took me many years, not many years, but it took me some time to understand this connection. And it's simply because if we have an organism that doesn't have information about something, the weather, right? So let's say a plant doesn't have information about the weather. Um, what it can do is simply say, OK, 10% of the offspring will behave as if it's dry. 90% will behave as if it's wet, and, uh, and that's it, right? Now, if I get information about the weather, I don't need to bet hedge. I can put all my offspring on the wet year, or all my offspring on the dry year. So it means that instead of having to divide my offspring in the first generation between different options, and then one of them happens, then I divide again between the option, one of them happens, and so on, with a, when I get the information, I can bet, I can put all my offspring on the thing that really happens, and sorry, here's a mistake, and then I'll get like, a f in this case, because each time four things can happen, four to the t fold increase in fitness. So the value of information is a four to the t, four to the number of generations a fold increase, or in general, h, right, the h is the difference between the uh, inf uh, entropy with and without the signal, so an h fold two to the h-fold increase for every generation. And this is why fitness can be measured in a, as an as a, a information measure, because it's a fold increase, fold, we count the number of possibilities there are. Okay, so here I analyze the simple thing of getting a cue from uh, the environment. Um, it would be really interesting to not just talk about cues, but instead talk about signals, and when two animals signal to one another, but I will not look at it here, it's too hard. Um, but instead, there is another thing that you can think of. So organisms have this uh, genome, right? The genome is a cue about the environment, right? So the genome might tell you, uh, you should grow wool, or you shouldn't grow wool, right? It's too cold, or it's too hot. So the genome gives you some cue about the environment, and everything we did here will tell you what the fitness benefit of a certain amount of information in your genome would be, right? So since the genome is a cue, um, the fitness benefit of one bit of information in your genome is, um, is limited by the mutual information between the genome and the environment, right? So it's, it's something very strange with, where without even knowing anything about the the, the environment, I can tell you that if you have one bit of information in your genome, the most it can help you is a twofold increase in your fitness. But uh, so this is this is a um, this whole measure is something that can limit the amount of inf uh, of fitness benefit that information in your genome can provide. Um, another interesting thing to know then is how does information get into the genome? If we know, knew um, how one bit of information gets into the genome, in what cases will you have one bit of information in your genome, then uh, we will know what, what in general the fitness benefits are of having information in your genome. And this is something that uh, there have been a couple of approaches to calculate it. Um, one of the first was by uh, Kimura in 61, but uh, I think we have not, this is something that is still I think an open question how much information gets into the genome for a certain amount of selection. Um, what I will uh, now switch to talking about, and this is the second half of my talk, I will talk about um, uh, the process that really gets information into the genome. Um, and this is the new part, so I switch to a totally different uh, part of the talk. So usually when you talk about a Darwinian evolution, right, I still have time. Uh, you talk about replication, variation, and selection. Um, and you talk about uh, biological organisms. 
I told you that, and also Ehud said, now I switch to work on uh, the origin of life. I'm interested, if you talk about the origin of life, it's before there was biology, so you talk about evolution in non-biological organism, organisms or non-biological entities, so in physics. Now I want to see um, how information gets into a, a physical system. I'm talking about the physical system, so out of these three forces, I drop two, and I only leave selection. So I, now I look at the effects of selection on the physical system. Um, and I, again, I, I, I wasn't the first one who had this idea, so if you go to Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, Chapter 2, First Paragraph, he, um, he already says, Darwin's survival of the fittest is really a special case of a more general law of survival of the stable all over. Uh, it's not just the universe is populated by stable things. So he already said that the selection principle applies everywhere, not just in biology. Um, and George Price, who introduced many interesting concepts in biology in his three years that he worked in biology, um, wrote a paper that was only published in 95 where he said, Despite the pervading importance of selection in science and life, there has been no abstraction and generalization. Thus, might, one might say that selection theory is a theory waiting to be born, much as communication theory was 50 years ago. And he was trying to really write down selection theory in this paper, but uh, I think that he didn't think that he succeeded, and that's why he did not publish this paper ever. Um, and I think that really, it would be really nice to have a theory of selection which really talks about how selection creates information. Um, so let's see a few examples from physics. Uh, we have atoms released in a huge nuclear exper uh, uh, not experiment, disaster like in Fukushima. Lots of atoms get released. Some are very stable atoms, some are unstable atoms. The unstable atoms uh, decay very quickly, the stable atoms <laughs> stay around for a long time. So if you wait five years after the disaster, most atoms that you will see around will be atoms that have a lifespan of five years or longer, right? All the ones that have a lifespan of one second are already gone. And so there was a selection process against atoms that decay too quickly, right? So in a system we'll have that we have a system at equilibrium, we take it out of equilibrium, all the things that are very unstable disappear very quickly, and the things that are more stable remain for a longer time. So do you have this kind of process of selection for stable things? Um, rocks on the hill. We have a hill, on the hill there's uh, rocks. We shake the hill, the rocks fall down or roll down the hill. If we go to the hill and we look at the rocks, the rocks that are there are ones that are more stable. So this was recently used in a paper where they counted how often you have things like this in order to say if a certain region has many or doesn't have many earthquakes, right? So if you see many of these, then probably this region didn't have earthquake for a long time, earthquakes for a long time. So uh, you have here selection for more stable formations. Um, another example is snowflakes. Snowflakes grow in a cloud. Uh, if a snowflake starts growing and it grows too densely in the middle, it will fall out of the cloud and stop growing. Therefore, when you look at the distribution and if a snowflake is fluffy enough, will continue to flow and float and grow. Therefore, the, um, uh, the shape of snowflakes that you see is determined by a selection process, that the snowflakes are more stable, right? The, they are fluffy in this case. Um, so this means if, if we allow selection to be taken into physics, it means that we can also borrow some equations that are used in population genetics in physics. And uh, one of them is Fisher's fundamental theorem. So Fisher's fundamental theorem says that, it uh, talks about the rate of increase in fitness. If we have um, a wide distribution where there's very good individuals, whoops, and very bad individuals, the fitness of the population will increase a lot when, uh, when we do selection. If everybody is approximately equal, the fitness will not change a lot when, uh, when we do selection. So, the rate of increase in fitness is uh, equal to the genetic variance, right? The, the bigger the variance, the, uh, the bigger the variance, the, the quicker fitness moves. This will also hold then in um, physics. So we can use Fisher's fundamental theorem to describe the rate of change of radioactivity after the Fukushima disaster, for example. Um, 
Another nice equation that we can use is the price equation, the same George Price, which is kind of, I mean, he saw it as a generalization of Fisher's fundamental theorem. And what the price equation says is, uh, it talks about the change of a mean of a certain property. So, the, for example, the property could be height of humans, right? The change of height in humans in a certain time is, uh, is equal to the covariance of height and, and survival. So does, so does height help you survive? If it helps you survive, then this is big. And the second thing is, plus the change in height of each individual human during that time, right? So humans, some humans grow, and therefore here you will have a change in height. If you take this over to physics, the first part, so you're talking about a mean of a certain property of a physical system, and you can divide it into two parts. One part is you're looking at the system, and now some of the, some of the entities in the system disappeared, right? atoms decayed, rocks rolled down the hill or whatever. So this talks about the fact that the mean changes because you're not looking anymore at all entities, you're only looking at those that survived, only that are still stable. And this is the physics, how the entities changed over time. So you break up the, the, ch the physical change in the system into two parts. One is the selection parts, where information gets into the system, so this is Selection puts information into your physical system, now not biological system, but it also is for biological systems. And here is the second part which describes the physics. Um, sometimes this will be bigger than this and then information will actually be lost, not gained. And, and now I will get into an even deeper morass than I have been till now. So instead of talking about information, I'll talk about function. Um, so when we want to say, we want to talk about function, there's a couple of t cases where we talk about functions. So for example, we ask, uh, what's the function of a CD tray, right? So a function of the CD tray is to act as a cup holder, right? But when you ask about the function of the CD tray, we kind of ask, well, whoever put it in there, why did they put it there, right? What's the reason, what did they imagine I will do with it, right? So when you talk about the function of the CD tray, it's the, whoever designed this, why did they put it in? We can also talk about function in biological systems, right? Uh, what is the function of the color of the moth? So, right, why is, this, why, is, why is the moth white or why is it black? What's the function of the color? And what we actually mean by this is how does the color of the moth help it survive? But actually, this is not, if, this is not precise. When we talk about biological systems, we actually ask, how did the color of the moth help the ancestors of this moth survive? So how did the color of the moth help it be here instead of her, its ancestors dying? So this is for biological systems. In general, when we talk about physical systems, it doesn't make sense to talk about function. So what is the function of the rings of Saturn? Um, it's, it's a meaningless question, right? But now, if we now accept this notion that you can introduce selection into any physical system, you can also take with, with it from biology the notion of function. And now you can ask, uh, you ca can ask about function in physical systems. So for example, we can ask, what is the function of this hole in the middle of the snowflake? And in terms of this survival story that is probably wrong, but uh, acts as a story in this talk, I can say that the hole in the middle of the snowflake and allow the snowflake to be not too dense and continue floating in the cloud so that it builds all this thing around it. If it had grown very dense in the middle, it would have uh, dropped out of the cloud and it wouldn't be the snowflake that we see. So the function, we can talk about the function of the hole in the middle as the property of the entity that allowed it to survive. So, um, now we could define, for physical systems, we could define function as the physical feature that contributes to stability of the entity. Okay? Five. Okay, good. Um, and we can, uh, we can use the price equation to talk, about, to talk about this function, quantify it. I, ho I mean, this is something that I have not been able to do yet. So it would be really nice, especially for this talk, if I could write this price equation in informational terms, and uh, I could say how many bits of function are introduced to a certain system, but sadly I haven't been able to do it yet. Maybe it's impossible. So, but uh, we can talk about the 
change in property, how, mu how, much func how functional is a certain property as the covariance of this property and survival plus this uh, change. So this, this will describe how function increased in a certain physical system. Um, and this does something very neat, I think, to physical systems. So when we talk about, the, when we are interested in the origin of life, right, the reason that we are kind of interested in the origin of life, we say, how did you get all this amazing uh, biology out there, right? Biology looks so different from physics. How did, how did it come about? And actually, to some degree, we ask, how did this function appear, right? How did the green leaves and the, this amazing shape of the dolphin, how did it come from non-physical objects, right? What we see here is now if we introduce selection into physics, then instead of saying, how come you have so much function in biology, no function in physics, how did function come out of non-function? Instead, now we say, how did you have so much function in physics, in biology, where in physics you have very little of it, right? So it's not a question of having versus not having function. Instead, it's a question of how did physics, uh, or biology, sorry, how did biology gather so much function where physics has very few bits of this function, uh, functional uh, thing? And the answer, of course, comes from the evolutionary process, which is through replication allows function to heap up. You get more and more function in every generation of selection. That's how biology manages to gather so much function. And, and this is something that I would like to understand. And, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. This is something that I still don't fully understand. I mean, of course, um, but even less than most things. Uh, but you're totally right. You know, if you if you have a sequence of, a, you know, like a, a hundred possibilities and you you want to, um, to select the best one without reproduction, then you need a system to be to the two to the power of a hundred, which is bigger than most things in the universe. Um, whereas with a, you know, with, with reproduction, you can easily find the best sequence in a few steps with a very small system. So reproduction is really the thing that allows you to have a small system. And um, this is something that I, I still don't know the answer to. Is it why the brain is so big? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Yes, yes. I mean, and this is why I put it there. So, um, I think you're right that the the um, in order to have the the um, the information that I was talking about in the first part of the talk, in, in order to have it available to the organism, uh, the way that it gets there is through the selection process. And so, so. so Thank you. 
Yeah, but I mean, um, so it's the the first part of the talk when I talk try to 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 say I have a certain amount of uh, of bits in Shannon information, mutual information. Um, I mean, it is a fact that Shannon information does not care about uh, the the meaning, right? And um, so it it is. Uh, I mean, it's it's really good that I still managed to fit to to get it to be linked to fitness. It's not necessary. So um, it could be that there is there would be there would have been no connection between you know Shannon information doesn't care about con uh, you know uh, context what what you talk about and. Gould information does, and there is no connection between the two. That might have also been a possible answer, much le much more boring. Um, I mean, so it's not it's not necessary that fitness can really be measured in in bits, and it has a very tight connection to Shannon information. So th this connection is not automatic. Uh, well, I mean, once you see it, it's there. Uh, but then you ask, how did how did um, there is a you know how did a, a relevant information get into the genome and that that the answer comes from the second part that selection puts it in there I, so uh, there is here something that is a bit tricky. So, um, uh, so when you draw uh, your balls out of the cup, it could be that the chance for each ball is different, right? Um, so this Shannon had there, um, and now uh, what typical sequences say is some, one step beyond that, and saying that when you draw balls out of the same cup many times. Um, 
even though each, you know, each draw, so drawing 100 white balls in a row, right, will have a certain chance, right, uh, p to the 100, uh, the notion of typical sequences say that you can actually ignore the, the, the sequences where you have 100 balls that are white or 100 that are black. The only thing that really has any uh, a measure of, of, uh, of the sequences, you only need to really consider for, for probability sense. For other senses, you need to consider also the others. Is only the sequences that have, you know, 90, 10 or a certain probability, right? This is one thing. This is exactly the yeah. point that I challenge. It's not necessarily that. Because the dynamics may be such that the 100 white pebbles in a row has high probability. It depends on, on the way that you draw them from the top. Right. But, but what I'm saying is if white is 90% and black is 10%, then most you only need, when you talk about probability, you only need to think about the cases where exactly 90% or approximately 90% of the time are white and 10% are black and you can ignore all the others. But this is still a, but another, so this is here, uh, Shannon does use the probability and the source, right? What Shannon does not use is saying that white balls give you $100 and black balls give you one cent or $10, right? Um, Shannon does not take into account the worth of the of the pebbles, right? Um, and uh, in but biology does care about the worth of the signal. So a line gives you, you know, like a, a, the outcomes are much, you know, the two outcomes have different, much bigger difference in fitness than uh, rocks on the moon. So that's what I was saying. The, the, so Shannon does take into account the probability of the outcomes of the source, but does not, at least the the uh, Trivial use does not take the the value, you know. Where, for example, we design a, a computer or communication system between computers using Shannon information, right? We we measure things in bits, but probably when there's a bank and the bank has a phone line, not all signals going through the phone line have the same va value, right? In some case, this stock went up is worth almost nothing. In another case, this stock went up is worth a lot. So you could say you should actually design the, you know, the compression algorithm in your banking system, not saying that all signals are equally, the value is equal, but instead use a bet hedging and Kelly to, to design the system. And maybe then the compression al will be totally different. Um, so that, that was my question. Say more about what kind of payoff structure it takes in order to make bet hedging worth it, since the expected value is always lower. Uh, yeah. So um, if you talk about, um, so, whoops, sorry. If you talk about a biological system, um, then, and this is really a place why uh, slightly fudged. Um, you need to have this case where you um, you reinvest uh, all your offspring in the next generation. Then the next generation, all your offspring will experience the same outcome. So they will all live in the same field in this case, and they all will see the same coyote. Uh, and then they will be reinvested. They again will live in the same field. So if they all see the same outcome all the time, um, then the right way to solve it is the way that I did here. Right? If, for example, they go to different fields, so if each of them sees a different outcome, which is the more usual uh, uh, case, then um, you, uh, then bet hedging already happens between them because some will, you know, some will be, stay inside and there will be the coyote out around, some will stay out and the coyote will come, so bet hedging will already happen automatically and they don't need, and then in some cases they don't need to bet hedge on their own. So they will, they, in this case, they will not do these weird strategies. Um, so in order for, the, for this strategy to be valid, this, bet, this pure bed hedging strategy, you need to have reinvestment for a long time and all your, all your uh, investment in every generation needs to see the same outcome. I don't know if this will answer your question. Yeah, yeah? okay. 
statement that uh, there is no function in physics. Um, and you indicated that at least in biology it's a selection of stable physics systems. There is a, I mean, there is a prior history which goes towards stellar evolution and planetary evolution, uh, and asking questions about what makes planetary systems habitable for possible life, um, which again is how typical is our own planetary system as compared to others that and it seems, at least what planetary scientists tell us, we are very atypical in terms of your sequences. How does that come into your story? And how do you put that into your story about origin? Yeah. Right. So there have been two types of using kind of information like, like you were talking about. One is the, the entropic principle. So saying that, um, uh, you know, out of all possible laws of the universe, the, the, the universe that we live in has to be one where we are possible or life is possible or something like this. So that's a selection process where you, you, it's not selection where you have many universes, they all coexist, and then only those where we are survive. And, that's, and, and so you would have this type of selection like I'm talking about here. It's more kind of reverse selection where you say it must be such that what we see around us is possible. Right? So this is one type of selection. And that type of selection, I think, is not, a, a, is not the same selection process that we have here. And the other, the other one that, was, that is actually used in physics, even though I, I mean, we can go into an argument about this, but where people say all these universes actually coexist, you have kind of this multiverse, and then the one that we are in was selected out of these universes, yes? Uh -huh. I'm talking about planetary system within our universe, uh -huh. of which there are 200, 300 such examples at the Right. Point. Yeah, but it, you can say the same. So you can either take kind of a selection process where you say all these uh, solar systems exist, and the ones where we are in, we are in it, right? So it's... A, it's it came to be. What do you mean came to be? They, I mean, they came from first set of stars. Uh -huh. Accumulated their dynamics, which make for planets. Yeah. So all I'm saying, we can talk about it later. But all I'm saying, you can have backward selection where you select. We are in one that has to. We have to be possible in it, right? So this is kind of backward selection, and you can have forward selection where the the systems exist, and the one the ones that we are in uh, are the only ones that survive. That would be similar to my selection process. But uh, usually the selection is kind of backwards, where you say. We are in. We must be in a solar system that allows us to be in it. But we can talk about it later. Yeah. Uh, joining me in thanking uh, Michael very much.